and more false positives. Okay, that's the theory. And now we're going to uh, we're going to look at how that theory of the grid and the index is actually used in practice now by SQL Server to um, to run a couple of uh, SQL queries. There we go. <laughs> okay, so to do this, first of all, um, here's the T-SQL required just to create a simple table. And this table contains two columns. It's got an ID column, which is just a char column. And we've got a shape uh, column, which is a geometry column. Now, the only other point to note here is I've added a cluster primary key to the table. Um, now, once we've created, once we've followed the rules, we've just heard about the grid cells, things like that, we've got down to our list of grid cells, which we're going to use to describe this geometry. The structure of the spatial index itself then is, is essentially a lookup from each grid cell reference to the primary key of the shape that occupies that grid. Okay? So before you can create a spatial index on a table, it must contain a cluster primary key because that's going to be the key which we, we actually look into to say which one of the rows intersected this grid cell. Yes? Um, no, it doesn't have to be an integer. It just has to be a, a there must be a, a primary key on the table, but no, it doesn't have to be an integer. Okay, so we've got our, we've got our table, and now I'm just going to chuck uh, some points into it. I've got four points here. And to add these points, I'm using the point method of the geometry data type, um, which takes three arguments. It's got the uh, x coordinates, the y coordinates, and then the spatial reference ID. Um, now, for this example, I'm just talking about some abstract points. I'm not particularly talking about a model of the Earth or anything. So I'm just using zero as the spatial reference ID in every case. Okay? And so we've got a table. We've got some points in it. Now we can get on to the, uh, the matter of actually creating the spatial index. Now, this is a, a bit of a complicated query, so I just want to step it through line by line. Um, the very top line... Well, that's just the normal T-SQL syntax for creating any sort of query, um, except for the word spatial. So create spatial index, then the name of the index, and the table and the column on which you want to create the index. Um, the only point to note about that is it's possible to create multiple spatial indexes on the same column, and each of those indexes can have different grid resolution settings. So you might want to contain... Uh, the same information in a high resolution grid and a low resolution grid and then direct different sorts of queries to use the different indexes. Um, now shape was a geometry column so we're going to use the geometry grid for this example. If it had been a geography column we'd use the geography grid instead. And then we look at the parameters of the index is what comes up now. Now the bounding box uh, is the complete area of space that we're going to decompose into our grid. In this case, I'm starting at a point at 0, 0, 0 and I'm going up to a point at 4,096, 4,096. So this is a square, essentially. Um, those values have been chosen for a reason, which you'll see in a second. Um, it's worth mentioning, if you're using the geography data type, you don't need to specify a bounding box. In fact, you can't specify a bounding box. Um, because the geography data type works on a globe, um, the bounding box is implicitly assumed to cover the complete globe. You can't index only a portion of that globe. But with the geometry data type, which operates on a flat plane, which potentially extends to infinity in every uh, dimension, you, you must specify the bounding box. And then we, we're doing the grids. So again, I'm using medium resolution at every one of the four levels for this. So that's an 8 by 8 grid. And I'm keeping the cells per object limit at 16, which is the default. Now, I said there was a, a reason why I'd chosen those values there. And the reason is because if I use a medium grid resolution at each of the four levels of the grid, and my level one grid extends from 0, 0 to 4096, 4096, each of my level one cells decomposes that space into an 8 by 8 grid. So each level one cell ends up being 512 by 512. Each level 2 cell divides that into 8, into 8 again, 
So what we've ended up with is each level four cell for this example is a one unit high by one unit wide cell. And that's just going to make the diagrams a bit easier to follow in the next section, basically. OK, so if we just have a little bit of a look at a picture, this is what our table now looks like. So we've got our four points, A, B, C, and D. Um, and the dotted lines there represent the, uh, the level four grid cells in our index. Now let's suppose we actually wanted to, to write a bit of a query. And we wanted to find out um, which of those four cells lay within this red polygon. Now, obviously, these are very basic examples, but this same sort of query is exactly the thing you'd write to find out you know, how many crimes were there in this county or which of these customers lies within this sales territory. Or, these are all the same sorts of queries, and SQL Server uses the same sort of processing. But to try to really step it through simply, we're, we're going to keep it as basic as we can. And here's the query that you might write to answer that question, which of those points lay within the polygon. So you define a new um, variable, which is a geometry variable, and that polygon definition there in red at the top, that's simply the red square which you saw on the last slide. And then we select all those rows from the table where the shape column intersects that polygon. Now when you run that query <coughs> and you look at the execution plan, you'll see something that looks a little bit like this. Um, it looks quite complicated for a query that apparently was quite simple, but I don't want you to worry too much about it. The thing that you, you need to pay attention to is, is over on the right-hand side down there. And if we highlight that item, you'll see it says clustered index seek spatial. So looking at the query plan, we know that the query processor is choosing a plan that's, that's hitting the spatial index. But we don't really know yet what, what it's doing when it gets that index. How does it do the primary filter? How does it do the secondary filter? And how is that influencing the performance of the query? Fortunately, SQL Server comes with a, um, a new stored procedure, or actually a set of system stored procedures, that are specifically designed for analyzing and explaining the performance of spatial queries. And we're going to use one called SP Help Spatial Geometry Index. Uh, again, there's a sister uh, stored procedure to this called SP Help Spatial Geography Index. And each one of them also has uh, XML versions, which dump the output as XML rather than a table data set. And the parameters I've supplied here to the index, I've supplied the table name, the index name that I want to find out more information about. Um, I'm also going to choose the verbose output setting to get a bit more information. And then the important thing is you supply what's called a query sample to this query. Remember that when we defined what I meant by spatial query, we're talking about a comparison between two geometries or two geographies. When we run this spatial index, we're supplying the column in the table as one of the things to which we're making a comparison. But then we also need to tell the stored procedure, OK, well, what's the other thing we're going to compare this column of data to? And that's called the query sample. So for this example, again, I'm using in red there. That's the definition of that red square. So we've got a table containing points. That's what's been indexed. And I want to find out, using this stored procedure, how is SQL Server going to find out which of those points lies within this query sample? And you get lots of data from this stored procedure. You get you know, a couple of hundred lines of, of interesting information. And we're just going to step through some of the important ones. So the first one, number of object cells in level four in index four. Well, that's not particularly surprising. Our table contains four points. Uh, each one of them lies in its own level four cell. So we've got four uh, level four cells in the index. Uh, there they are. Um, the next thing, and this is an important point, I, I, I'm going to stress this a bit. When you're comparing those two geometries, the query sample and the points in the index, both of them must be tessellated down to the same index grid. So though the, the index only exists on the table, in order to do the primary filter against that query sample, we're going to compare the query sample to the same index, okay? uh, to the same grid. Sorry. So we also say, how many level four cells are there in the query sample? Well, there are eight cells around the outside that partially intersect the geometry. 
And there's also one cell in the middle there that's completely covered. And we store all of those in the index, and we also store a little flag to say, was this partially intersected or fully covered? And we'll use that flag in a minute to answer one of the questions. And then the primary filter, when we say which of these points lies within the polygon, what the primary filter does essentially is it doesn't look at the points in the polygon at all. What it does is it looks at the grid cells that are occupied by the points and the grid cells that are occupied by the polygon, and it compares them. And on the basis of that comparison, this is how our primary filter can make its guess as to which of the points actually satisfy the query. For example, point A lies or partially intersects a cell that doesn't have any cells in common with the polygon. Okay? That blue cell there doesn't have anything with the polygon at all. So we know, based on the primary filter alone, that that point definitely can't lie within the polygon, and we can exclude it from the primary filter. So that's 25% of the rows from our base table. We don't have to bother calling ST intersects on them because we know that they can be excluded. That leaves us with the remaining three points, and they are selected by the primary filter. Now, at this point, you might think, OK, so we've got the other three rows. All of those have to be passed from the primary filter to the secondary filter. But actually, we can do a little bit better than that. Point B, oh, sorry, let me do that. Point B partially intersects a cell that was totally covered by the red polygon. Now, in that circumstance, we know that point B itself must lie within the red polygon. There's no way it could partially lie in a square that was totally covered and not be included itself. So point B, we can pre-select based on the primary filter alone. Again, we don't have to call the secondary filter. So 33% of the rows selected by the primary filter can be included in the result set, and that's called the internal filter when we're able to do that. And that leaves us with the remaining two points, C and D, that we're not sure, basically, based on the primary filter alone, if they're inside or outside the polygon. Let's call the secondary filter. The secondary filter is, is essentially the ST intersects method itself, and that's going to compare the individual point sets of the geometry to come out with the, uh, the right result. So there's two rows output. The two rows of B and C, we knew that at the start. It was obvious to us they're contained in the polygon, but that's how SQL Server processes it. And the important thing to know is whatever grid settings we'd use there, if we'd had high resolution, low resolution, no grid at all, we'd always get the same results. We'd always have B and C be the answer. But the difference is how those results were obtained. Could they be discarded from the primary filter? Could they be pre-selected by, by the primary filter? Or would they have to go through the secondary filter? And that's what makes the difference to the speed of your queries, really. What you want is to get that primary filter as efficient as possible. When we come to measure how good the primary filter being, there's two efficiency measures we use. The first is one called the primary filter efficiency. And what that is, is it's a measure of... Um,